Hi everyone, my name is Joshua Miles, and I'm guessing if you're watching this, then you are a massive true crime enthusiast just like me. For those of you who are in the US, who are avid true crime fans, you'll probably have heard about CrimeCon. Now, CrimeCon is the world's number one true crime event, and I am delighted to let you know that CrimeCon has made the jump across the pond and has arrived in the UK. And I do hope that I will get to see all of your lovely faces there. Blazing fires, raging adrenaline, and total anarchy, all within the walls of a federal prison. FBI tactical teams and negotiators work around the clock, trying to avoid a small-scale war, and keep nearly 100 hostages alive. In the 1980s, the federal penitentiary in Atlanta housed some of the country's most notorious prisoners. 1,800 Cubans fleeing Castro's regime. 400 were hardened criminals. 200 were insane. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Castro called them undesirables. The U.S. government called them detainees. In 1987, they staged a bloody revolt. Now, the FBI and special operations teams must infiltrate a burning prison to stop the violence before it rages out of control. Cuba, 1980. A plummeting economy and political unrest prompt Fidel Castro to allow Cuban citizens to leave the country. For the first time in history, the notorious dictator permits American boats to enter Cuba's Mariel Harbor. In a five-month period, over 120,000 undocumented refugees flee the country, heading for Florida. 2,700 are considered criminals or mentally ill under U.S. law. The Attorney General instructs the Bureau of Prisons to find space for them in America's already overcrowded prison system. 1,000 Cuban refugees are sent to the Federal Detention Center in Oakdale, Louisiana. Nearly 1,400 are transported to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. For seven years, the U.S. and Cuban governments negotiate to send the criminals and mentally ill refugees back to Cuba. On November 20th, 1987, the State Department strikes a treaty with Cuba. Over 2,700 Cuban detainees will be sent back. Within 24 hours, Cuban detainees in both prisons get news of the decision. In Oakdale, Louisiana, a thousand of them riot, taking 28 prison guards hostage. But at the Atlanta Penitentiary, all is quiet. Warden Joe Petrovsky, but there was a trust between the detainees and the correctional officers, and that trust was basically the treatment that the detainees got from the correctional officers. Early Monday morning, three days after the treaty is signed, prison employee Ted Manier arrives at work. He notices an eerie silence. There were hardly any inmates in the breakfast area. And normally it would be uh, full of inmates who were making a lot of noise and talking, and there was hardly anybody in there, so it was really quiet, unusually quiet. On the first floor of the Prison Industries building, detainees make mattresses. On the surface, it looks like business as usual. But in an instant, 
Detainees overpower their guards and ignite fires. On the third floor of the industry's building, Manir and his supervisor oversee a furniture making shop. In a matter of minutes, the riot spreads to the rest of the floors. It sounded like a roar, and it was coming up the stairwell. They got the door down, and they just came running in. And they had these hoods over their head, like they were made out of gray T-shirts or gray sweatshirts. And they just had holes poked out for their eyes so they could see. Manir tries to report the emergency, but he is attacked by one of the rioters. And I don't know if he was trying to hit me or just the telephone out of my hand. But he knocked the phone out of my hand that went across the room. Prison employees are facing their worst nightmare. Although they are well aware of the risks, they never thought it would happen to them. But we did realize there was a threat, but I guess you think you can control it. When you work with inmates, you get used to them, and sometimes you forget who they really are. The guards and factory workers are helpless. Unarmed and outnumbered, they face rioters carrying homemade weapons. The staff member notifies Warden Petrovsky of the crisis. Inside the wall, nobody carried weapons. The inmates always vastly outnumbered the staff. So if we had weapons in there, we could lose those weapons. The only weapons that we had was weapons in the tower. Petrovsky alerts the FBI and the prison's regional director. I try to give him an assessment of exactly what transpired and brought him up to date. As fire spreads throughout the industry's building, the detainees force the guards and employees into a tool cage and lock the door. We kind of thought that unless there was some miracle, that we would probably just burn up because there was no way to get out of one of the cages. The riot spreads throughout the entire penitentiary complex. Enraged detainees capture guards, taking keys as they take hostages. They begin to release the regular prison population from their cells. The riot is beyond containment. The detainees now control most of the central buildings. Rioters attempt to gain access to the main cell block, but guards lock down the sally port just in time. As flames and smoke engulf the massive prison complex, nearly 100 guards and employees are trapped inside. Built at the turn of the century, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary is the largest penitentiary in the United States. It was a fortress inside that was surrounded by a wall. It raised from the ground approximately 40 feet, and the width on the top of the wall was approximately three uh, yards wide. So it was a massive, massive wall. Show me what you got. The penitentiary is built on 300 acres of land with 28 acres of property inside the walls. Okay, well, we've got guards. Warden Petrovsky needs to figure out exactly where his people are located inside the complex. We had staff members in 11 towers that had very good observation over the entire outside compound who logged those employees that they recognized in those areas. We started a list of the officers that we thought were hostages. Yeah. 
Ted Muneer and his colleagues are trapped inside an equipment cage in the Burning Industries building. Several rioters try to convince the Cuban detainees guarding the cage to unlock the door. They were trying to uh, talk the guard into opening the door because they wanted to get us out and kill us or do whatever. So the guard had to tell them that they couldn't open the door and occasionally they would push one off or get in a little wrestle. But the raging fire threatens to destroy the building. So the rioters are forced to move their hostages to another part of the prison complex. The only route takes them across the yard in clear view of the towers. spots what he believes are detainees threatening prison employees. There was a guy that was up ahead of me, and he got hit. I, I remember seeing him. He was a Cuban. He got hit right behind the ear. One of the hostage takers is killed, and five others are wounded. I was getting worried because the bullets were going pretty close around where we were. Chaos reigns as guards and detainees run for cover. They ran us across to the corner of the building where they couldn't shoot at us. And that time they took us in the chapel. Detainees forced their hostages into a small room and locked them inside. Less than an hour after the riots begin, FBI agents from the Atlanta field office arrive at the penitentiary. The FBI has jurisdiction over criminal matters in all federal prisons. Warden Petrovsky briefs Weldon Kennedy, the special agent in charge. The first thing that I wanted to accomplish was to find out how many hostages had been taken, uh, how many might be injured, uh, what was the threat to those people who were, in fact, taken hostage. All of these people were like on an emotional high. I mean, they'd been prisoners for literally eight, 10 years, uh, some of them serving life sentences, and now they're free to roam around the prison. It was like a holiday. This is the area where they... Agent Leon Blakeney heads the Atlanta FBI SWAT team. Agent Blakeney appears in silhouette to protect his identity. Nobody really knew what area that the, uh, that the inmates controlled. And, they really didn't know how many hostages were taken. You had 2,500 people housed in that institution. Here's the administration. There were people running around uh, all over the place, and, and quite frankly, it was chaos. Chaos that had already turned deadly. As agents Kennedy and Blakeney developed their plan to retake the prison, they received critical intelligence from two sources from FBI agents posted outside the walls of the prison complex, and from prisoners inside the walls who don't want any part of the riot. We began to learn uh, who the hostages might be, where the detainees were holding up, uh, how many were there, uh, what kind of weapons they might have. The detainees have taken the guards' radios, compromising prison communications. Agents and guards switch to a secure frequency. Two white males and two black males. The situation is grim. Negotiations will be critical to resolving the standoff. Special Agent D. Rosario, an FBI negotiator, opens up a dialogue with the rioters. Unreasonable demands are being made the hostage takers want things done now. And that's why it is so important to try to bring them down to a level where they can be reasonable. Can you negotiate with people at that very high emotional level? Generally speaking, no. So we had to give it time. The rioters are emotionally charged angry over the shooting death of a detainee. This theme came up time and again. You killed one of ours. 
you had no reason to and you killed them. And they wanted me to see the bodies. So I had the body brought out to where we were. I looked at the body. They wanted me to get emotionally involved with them. And these four that originally came out to talk to me really were only speaking for themselves. They were not speaking on behalf of the 1,400 that were in there. In the command post, Warden Petrovsky receives a frantic call from 16 employees who have barricaded themselves in cell block E. E block is home to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary's most dangerous criminals. These particular group of inmates were locked away and E to keep them from harming someone. If the detainees get into cell block E and free the inmates, the lives of all 16 employees will be in danger. The E cell block is also home to the prison system's most notorious inmate, Thomas Silverstein. A number of people in the Bureau of Prisons told me that he singularly was the toughest prisoner they believed that the Bureau of Prisons had ever housed or had in their custody. He was just an absolute uh, animal. And he hated everything to do with uh, the Bureau of Prisons or any of their staff. Silverstein was incarcerated in 1975 for a bank robbery. Years later, he was sentenced to multiple life terms for fatally stabbing an inmate and a prison guard. Thomas Silverstein was cold and he was a killer. He had two things on his mind to escape from jail because his crimes were such where he was going to die in jail. Uh, and then the other objective was to kill people. Uh, it was as simple as that. The guards in cell block E are in grave danger. Special Agent Kennedy works with the FBI SWAT team to come up with a plan to rescue them. The SWAT analysis was that they believed that they could go over the wall out of view of the rioting detainees and retrieve those people out of that building successfully. The SWAT team will need ladders to get over the 40-foot high wall. Special Agent Blakeney calls on the Atlanta Fire Department and a National Guard helicopter crew to help carry out the plan. We put a helicopter up uh, on the opposite side of the prison to attract their attention and uh, at least we have some diversion. Hey, Chief, here's the situation. We've got a hostage Seven hours after the riot began, the FBI SWAT team launches a daring mission to rescue 16 prison employees without endangering the lives of nearly 100 hostages. Seven hours after a riot breaks out at Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, an FBI SWAT team launches a mission to rescue 16 employees barricaded in one of the prison cell blocks. FBI Special Agent Weldon Kennedy knows that if the rescue attempt is seen by rioting Cuban detainees, it could spell disaster. They would not hesitate to kill hostages if it became apparent to them that we were going to try to retake the prison or retake any part of it. After scaling the wall, the FBI SWAT team approaches cell block E, home to the prison's most dangerous inmates. SWAT rushes the prison employees out of the building. Keep your head down. Identify yourself when you get down there. Across the prison yard, 27 employees, afraid for their safety, have barricaded themselves inside the prison hospital. Frustrated, they watch as their colleagues are escorted to safety. FBI SWAT team leader Leon Blakeney. You know, they're screaming, frantic, you know, come and get us, come and get us. The director of the Bureau of Prisons urges the FBI SWAT team to go back for the hospital employees. The SWAT personnel informed me that there was a 100% probability that they would be detected going over the wall to try to effect a rescue of the hospital people. We can't protect the other hostages 
that are being held in other parts of the prison. And my concern was if, if in fact we were observed, then uh, they would start killing the other employees. Blakeney wants to rescue the hospital staff, but knows it's a risk he cannot afford. The detainees break into cell block E and release the inmates. Vicious criminals run free, including Thomas Silverstein, a ruthless killer. As darkness falls, three buildings have been consumed by fire. Nearly 100 guards and employees have been taken hostage or have barricaded themselves inside the prison. Prison employee Ted Manier is being held inside a room in the prison's chapel. So man came up to the window and he wasn't a Cuban. And the guy beside me said, that's Silverstein. And he came inside and he had a flashlight and he started shining his flashlight. He shined the light on me and said, don't I know you? And I told him, no. He said, I don't, I've never seen you before. And he said, you don't know who I am? He looked worse than anything I've ever seen in any type of movie or anything. And when you look at him, you know he isn't a normal. <laughs> There's something, something strange about him. Uh, he's really scared. Detainees finally distract Silverstein and he leaves without harming the hostages. On day two of the standoff, FBI tactical commander Danny Colson arrives at the prison. You could hear this huge roar. It was like a million bumblebees. You could almost feel the energy of those rioting prisoners. Colson started the FBI's hostage rescue team, an elite counterterrorism group in 1982. The HRT is law enforcement's equivalent to the Navy SEALs of the Army's Delta Force. The only unit in the United States that has a sophisticated explosive or thermal breaching capability is the FBI's hostage rescue team. But the HRT is already tied up handling the riot at Oakdale. So I was going to a, a very difficult tactical assignment without the team I was used to commanding. Despite not having the hostage rescue team available to him, Colson must still develop a full-scale tactical rescue plan. He faces several obstacles. A prison is built to keep bad guys in. You have barred doors, you have steel gates. Well, these same type of things keep a rescue force from getting in. I needed help from the military, primarily from the Delta Force. Delta Force is the Army's special operations unit, but using them at the prison would be illegal. A posse comitatus law was passed right after the Civil War, and that law prevents the military from being involved actively with their personnel in civil law enforcement. Barring approval from the White House, the FBI must rely solely on civilian law enforcement Weldon Kennedy assembles over 400 SWAT members at the prison. We had SWAT teams from all around the country, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, as well as, of course, the immediate uh, surrounding area. We figured that based on the capability we had, we were probably maybe an hour away from getting in to rescue the hostages. We were all concerned that, that, that they started killing hostages. We, we were helpless to get in there. And that's one of the reasons that, that D. Rosario and the other negotiators were working so hard to try to get somebody to talk to to calm the situation down. But the negotiations are not going well. None of the rioters D. Rosario has spoken with has enough power to influence the detainees. The negotiators need a different approach. We could be here for a very long time 
unless we come up with a group of people in there among the detainees that can speak basically for, if not all of them, for the majority. Rosario asks prison employees which detainees command the most respect. Files of these people were opened to us, and we looked at several of them. And we decided on five or six men. We went to the grading and called them by name. And they came to the grading and we invited them to come over to our side and sit down at a table with us and talk with us. The detainees agreed to talk with negotiators. And we began our first serious conversations in terms of how can we resolve this? What is it that you are looking for? The number one demand that they had was that ultimately the Immigration and Naturalization Service conduct individual hearings for each and every one of them to remain in the United States. It's a straightforward request. Rosario agrees to pass it on to the Department of Justice. As the meeting ends, the negotiator uses a bit of psychology to help solidify the group's standing as leaders within the prison. We uh, decided to give these men the mail that had accumulated since before the riot began. In the penitentiary, daily mail is an important link to the outside world. They went back in there, and we could literally hear the shouting of glee uh, when these guys showed up with two bags full of mail. We believe it created in the minds of the others that these guys could get things done for them. And that's where it began. After that, we kept asking for the same men. Rosario is beginning to make progress, but negotiations go slowly. In the prison hospital, 27 trapped employees are out of time. Detainees are trying to break down the door of the hospital with a battering ram. The employees call Warden Petrovsky in the command center. Warden Petrovsky relays the information to Weldon Kennedy. Detainees could break through the hospital doors at any moment. We had 27 people in there, and there was concern that once the hospital was taken over, they might be injured or even killed. So the ram is going, we can hear it as a matter of fact, banging the metal doors of the prison. Bureau of Prison officials worry about what could happen if detainees get access to the drugs and narcotics stored in the hospital. What about right here? Weldon Kennedy asks HRT Commander Danny Colson for a second assessment. I said, yeah, we can get him out. We can go over the wall. We can defend the area with the perimeter and slot them out over the walls and we're out of there. Colson's biggest concern is that the detainees are watching news coverage of the riots. Inmates were watching TV to see what we were doing as much as they could and they could very well believe that a rescue of the entire prison was underway, and then they could start executing the hostages. Hospital workers are moments away from becoming hostages, or worse. So here we have a huge dilemma. Do we go in and take those people out of the hospital and save them, or do we let them be taken hostage? Kennedy decides a rescue is too risky. My decision was, based on all the information that I had, we will not go for the rescue. I will not authorize the rescue. And when he went back in and announced it to the Bureau of Prisons, I remember one Bureau of Prisons official storming past me and looking at me and said, if those are FBI agents, you'd go get them. And I said, no, he wouldn't. Weldon Kennedy wonders if he has just signed a death warrant for 27 innocent people.
For two days, a riot rages at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Dozens of Cuban detainees now control the prison. 27 Bureau of Prison employees are trapped in the prison hospital. Weldon Kennedy, special agent in charge of the FBI's Atlanta field office, makes a tough decision. If we entered the penitentiary, if we tried to retake it, there was a threat they were going to immediately kill them all. Kennedy decides not to launch a rescue mission. Two hours after the decision, communication is lost with the employees in the prison hospital. That's the warden. Pick up if you hear me. I knew that if anything happened to any one of those 27 people, that I would forever live with that uh, as being the person responsible. Guards stationed at the prison towers gather intelligence as detainees move hostages across the prison yard. One guard calls the FBI command post with a disturbing development. A group of detainees is dragging acetylene tanks into a basement where they can access the prison's utility tunnels. Danny Colson is the FBI's tactical commander at the scene. They might be able to bring those tanks and get enough of them underneath our command post where the tunnels ran and uh, cause an explosion which would have decimated the command post and maybe allowed them to escape. Colson and the FBI SWAT team prepare to go down into the tunnels. The tunnels were, were designed for two purposes. One is the, all the utilities went through the tunnels, the steam pipes, the electrical pipes, and they were big tunnels. There were also ventilation tunnels that uh, started uh, big enough for a man to walk in standing up and ended up uh, only a few inches uh, uh, high. Colson and SWAT team leader Leon Blakeney have no idea what they will encounter once they are inside. Prison maps aren't reliable and communication with agents above ground is not possible. As the team makes their way through the underground maze of pipes, they encounter a group of detainees. Leon Blakeney. Once we got in the tunnels, we discovered then that, that in fact the Cubans were in there. And oftentimes we'd come in very close proximity to them, uh, within 10 feet. Of them, there would be a bunch of them, and we'd confront them. And fortunately, uh, every time they turn around and run, the SWAT team is unable to find the acetylene tanks in the vast underground system. But they are convinced the detainees are exploring the tunnels for a possible escape route. We decided that the tunnel system was was a real threat to the successful uh, resolution of, of the crisis. Ultimately, we were able to, to station uh, SWAT teams down there. The Chicago SWAT team. I handle one part of the tunnel system, and the Washington Field Office SWAT team handle another uh, part of the tunnel system. On day three of the standoff, Danny Colson receives intelligence from agents with high-powered binoculars positioned around the prison. The detainees have moved nearly all the hostages to a building known as the American Dorm. Colson begins to formulate a tactical rescue plan. And what do you think they I mean? What, what can they... Outside the prison, Crowds gather. Families of the hostages, the prison guards, and even the detainees wait for information about their loved ones. The media covers breaking news from the penitentiary. There was hundreds of media people there. There were networks. There was local TV. They established a tent city right across the street from the, from the prison. A single reporter and a simple error threatened to bring the standoff to a violent end. Special Agent D. Rosario. The New York SWAT team was coming off shift, and the Chicago SWAT team was coming on shift, and they passed each other right at the steps of the administration building. And it looked impressive because there was two very large groups of armed men all dressed in black local reporter in Atlanta uh, is watching this and sees these 40 or 50 men dressed in SWAT gear going up the front steps and jumps to the conclusion and says so on live TV that, well, there they go. Looks like the FBI is going to retake control of the prison. When the detainees see the media report, they take immediate action. 
they brought several hostages out to the yard. And for the benefit of, of our cameras so we could see them, they brought these hostages out and they poured gasoline over them. And then they took their cigarette lighters and began clicking whilst literally screaming at us, if you want to assault us, go ahead. As soon as you do, we're setting fire to these men. Without knowing it, a young journalist may have just made a mistake that could cost the lives of nearly a hundred innocent people. At the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI agents negotiate with Cuban detainees who have taken over the prison. The lives of nearly 100 hostages hang in the balance. On day three of the standoff, a journalist's error ignites a crisis. FBI tactical commander Danny Colson. All along our negotiators have been telling the, the Cubans that, that we weren't coming in, that we wanted to negotiate and wanted them to surrender. And now a reporter is saying we're coming in. The erroneous media report makes Special Agent D. Rosario's job even tougher as he negotiates for the lives of the hostages. We had brought them down to such a, a reasonable level of emotion, and when they thought that the FBI was about to assault, they literally lost it. We came literally within a few heartbeats of losing the hostages right then and there. We sent everybody to what we call phase line green, which is the last position you are in before you do a rescue. It was like a spark that was uh, about to uh, ignite this terrible inferno of, of, uh, of energy we had built up there. I had to convince them that no such assault was going to take place. And that, you know, if, if things were going so well and so positive, why would we even think about assaulting them? After three tense hours, the rioters agree to continue negotiations and spare the hostages. We're just lucky that our negotiators were able to calm them down and we didn't have any loss of life. For Colson, the close call is a warning sign that the standoff could explode into a full-scale riot with very little provocation. At the end of day three, he obtains presidential approval to deploy Delta Force in a civilian crisis. The special operations team arrives in Atlanta disguised as FBI agents. There were three things that I desperately needed from them. The first was their breaching capability. They had all the breaching capability that would be necessary to get back into that prison to do a dynamic rescue. They had the ability to use explosives to blow steel gores down or blow locks out. They had the ability to use thermal devices to cut in an instant through steel and cable. The second thing I wanted was their sniper capability. When we went into that prison, if we had to go in, I wanted the very best snipers I could find doing cover for my men as they went in. The other thing is they have tremendous medical capability. They travel with a complete hospital. Uh, they set up with the doctors, nurses, uh, emergency equipment, uh, the latest state-of-the-art everything. If Delta Force or FBI teams engage the detainees in combat, the military hospital is prepared to treat any injury. They can bring their doctors right in with us. They can pop a chest and do open heart surgery right there in the premises if necessary. For the next several days, Delta Force snipers keep the detainees under constant surveillance. The rioters are working 24 hours a day, making weapons by the thousands. There's all kinds of steel inside the, uh, the prison, and they were very resourceful with the equipment. They ground weapons into spears. Each one of them must have had at least two weapons. Delta Force sets up surveillance cameras all over the complex to track the movement of the detainees. Okay. Agents look for ways to get closer to the areas where the hostages are being held. The Cuban detainees decide to kill the hostages. The tactical team must be able to launch an assault on a moment's notice. We've got uh, two people guarding the American dorm. 
This is not something where you play a video game and after it's over, you hit your reset button and everybody's alive again. You're talking about the lives of human beings here, and you have a tremendous responsibility to try to get those people out. Colson and Blakeney go back into the tunnels underneath the prison. One of the tunnels leads to the prison's electrical room. It's located right outside the American dorm, where most of the hostages are held. We were literally uh, on the other side of the window from inmates that were uh, right, across, right across the walkway from where the hostages were being held. By doing that, we moved our response time from half an hour to 10 seconds. It was a tremendous, a tremendous leap in our capability at that point. With the FBI SWAT teams and Delta Force in place, they will be in a better position to protect the hostages if negotiations break down. Until they start harming a hostage, there's no reason for us to try to gain forcible entry to save these people. We therefore will wait as long as it takes. The rioters have enough food to survive for up to a year. The day after Thanksgiving, they erect a Christmas tree on the roof of the building. That was very disheartening to us. Maybe they didn't intended psychologically to be that way. We interpret it as we are going to be here through Christmas. On day eight of the crisis, prison guards stationed in the tunnel hear the sound of a drill. One guard recognizes the voice of Thomas Silverstein, the most vicious inmate in the federal prison system. They think Silverstein is searching for a way out. We knew he would absolutely kill a hostage if it, if he, it would help him escape. Weldon Kennedy asks Danny Colson to go back into the tunnels to apprehend Silverstein. So we walked down the tunnel and, and we did a tactical formation going down the tunnel. We had lights on our weapons. Suddenly we noticed there was water on the floor and then the water started getting deeper and it was over the tops of our shoes and then over our ankles and up to our knees. And what we finally realized is that that tunnel was actually flooded. The water flooding the tunnels had been dumped by National Guard helicopters to fight the fires. Looking further into the tunnel, he can see water fills it to the ceiling. He knows there is no way Thomas Silverstein can be in there. And what they were hearing was there were, there were tubes, ventilation tubes, that were above the water line. So the guards were actually hearing his voice, but we knew he wasn't going to get out. Still, Colson knows that Silverstein is as dangerous inside the prison as he is on the outside. He was a sociopath, and he'd already he'd proven he would commit murder. So had he done that, had he attempted to, to harm a guard or, or anybody else in there, uh, it would have caused us to have to go in and launch a rescue we didn't want to have to launch. And then again, we were faced with significant loss of life. Knowing Thomas Silverstein is such a dangerous wild card, FBI negotiator D. Rosario must convince the detainees to turn him over. United States, okay? I emphasized and kept re-emphasizing the fact that uh, Tommy Silverstein could become a very grave liability to the Cuban detainees and to their cause and to what they were trying to attain. I was told that uh, they would think about it. Rosario tells the rioters that until Silverstein is back behind bars, the hostages are in grave danger. As long as the vicious killer roams free, the standoff could come to a sudden and violent end. More than a week into the intense standoff with Cuban detainees at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI negotiators worry that a dangerous American prisoner could jeopardize a peaceful end to the conflict. What I suggested to them was that at some point or another, it would be in your best interest to turn Tommy Silverstein over to us. Special Agent D. Rosario tries to convince the rioters that Silverstein is a serious threat to prison employees who are being held hostage. 
The American inmate is jeopardizing their position in the negotiations. A short time later, a large group of detainees appears at the Sallyport gate of the main cell block. And there was about 100 Cubans screaming, waving their sabers in the air. And I could see they had silver stain. And in the midst of all these screaming Cubans, they threw, literally threw Silverstein at us. Detainees tell agents how they captured Silverstein. So they gained access to the pharmacy. They took some narcotic. They put it in a can of uh, fruit cocktail, which he was known to like, and fed him fruit cocktail laced liberally with this drug, which in effect knocked him out. The FBI viewed Silverstein's capture as an act of good faith. That told us a lot. They don't want to hurt the hostages. It showed the negotiators that these Cubans were responsible. They were willing to do things to cooperate with us in order to reach a common goal, which is a, a great step in any negotiation process. On December 1st, a separate riot at Louisiana's Oakdale Penitentiary is resolved. The Cuban detainees incarcerated at Oakdale agree to release their hostages if the INS will review their cases. The government of the United States, through the voice of the Attorney General, told them, you know, it's not unreasonable to give you a hearing. D. Rosario offers the Atlanta detainees the same deal. Hostage takers have gotten exactly what they want, but still, negotiations stall. Audio surveillance reveals the rioters think the FBI will not use deadly force to remove them from the prison, that they would have a fighting chance to overpower federal forces. The Cubans thought that the FBI and uh, the other assets would come in with nightsticks and batons and just duke it out. The next day, Colson decides to send the hostage takers an indelible message. The detainee agrees to talk with Colson. And he said, I need to go to the restroom. So I said, wait right here. So I went around the barrier, and I got the uh, Marshall's SOG team and the New York City SWAT team. I, I got them all up, and I said, put on all your gear and line up along the walls and look mean. And he walked around that barricade, and when he walked down that corridor, he literally jumped off the ground. And I said, this is not going to be a, a nightstick duel with your swords. We're going to use deadly force. The rioters agree to the terms of the surrender. On day 12 of the standoff, the Cuban detainees release their hostages. I will never, ever forget those guys coming through that sally port and walking right by me and, and the look of relief. They were haggard and they were tired and they were worn out, but this great sense of relief and they're all smiling ear to ear. When we finally walked out with hostages, not one of them having been harmed in any way. We regarded that as a huge success. After 12 intense days, the Atlanta prison riot is over. One of the most important things that sort of focused the American public on the plight of the Cubans. And um, I think that was important. They did have a story to tell. They just told it in the wrong way. After the riots, all detainees are granted an INS hearing. Some are released. Others with criminal records or mental disabilities are repatriated back to Cuba. The rest remain in prison.